grab, there's a sermon insert in your service folder. Um, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 22 and just a very simple thing. What we have, Peter talked about seeing Jesus as an example for how to suffer. We, and as we look at this today, there, those are the two things I want you to see. Jesus as Savior and Jesus as example. How do, we, how do we endure suffering and how does the suffering and the rejection of Jesus help us to do so? Uh, it's the gospel from Luke 22. So please stand out of respect for Jesus. And then one of the things we do here at Mount Lebanon and other Lutheran churches is after the gospel, we say, this is the gospel, Lord. And because it's good news, you're invited to say, thanks be to God because of the good word that he has for us. Luke chapter 22, Luke writes this. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they, then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We, we have heard it from his own lips. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Messiah, the anointed one of God, anointed to save anointed to advocate, anointed to defend, anointed for rejection, rejection that we might be accepted. Lord Jesus, help us to see you. As I speak your word and unpack it, un unfold it for your people, let the words of my mouth be, be pleasant in your, and pleasing in your sight. Let the hearing of our ears, the way that we receive your word, Holy Spirit, wing, wing on those words and come to our hearts that we might believe it. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, let it all be pleasing in your sight, God. You alone are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, I'll ask you to pray for me today as I unpack God's word so I can say it to you clearly in a way that makes sense and that hits you in your heart so that you might believe in Jesus. Nobody, nobody likes rejection. I, I can't think of a single person who does not even one, not even the littlest people among us. When our little people come home, your little people, when they come home from wherever they are, if something happens where there's something, some disharmony, some rejection, some mean words, some not sharing of toys, what's the first thing they tell you? Somebody did something to me. They want you to do something about it because they don't like rejection. They don't like it when somebody takes something, when somebody says something, when, when the whole class is over here and they feel like they're over here, when there's an in-group but they're not part of the in-group. Nobody likes rejection. Not even one. Not even our, our middle-aged people. And by middle-aged, I mean like that, 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 that age between like little people, like K4, K5, first grade, and high school, college. Those are the middle people to me because I'm on the old end of things now. Right? Our, our young people, our middle schoolers, our high schoolers, our college kids, these burgeoning adults, they, they like to pretend that it never hurts. Right? People can say things, they can be left out, they, they can, there can be a, somebody can troll them on Instagram or social media, people can say mean things about them or behind their back, they can be left out of things and they like to pretend, eh, who cares? And maybe sometimes that's true. They really don't care. They're just, they're, they're kids, so they're just flippant about some things. But, but sometimes it's also simple and true that the things that people say, whether it's in print or on media or verbally or behind our back, the rejection that people give to us, no matter how old, it still hurts. You'd like to think that as we gray, as we wrinkle, as we age, as we mature, that that would hurt less. 
that, that somebody could say something to us, that somebody could say something about us, that we could be rejected by other people. We'd like to say to ourselves that as we wrinkle and gray and mature, that it wouldn't hurt anymore because we've learned. Our skin has thickened. We're tough as an alligator hide. Is that tough hide? Like we're, we're tough like that? So when, when we're rejected by people, it doesn't matter anymore. But the truth of the matter is in the quiet of our homes, in the, in the thoughts of our minds, those words, those actions, that rejection, it circulate. We ruminate. Nobody likes rejection. I can't think of a single person who likes it. Now, now before I talk about the because, why does it hurt, I want to define carefully today what I'm talking about when I talk about rejection. Because I'm not talking about any old rejection that just happens because people are sinful. But we could certainly have a whole sermon about that where people are mean and they reject us simply because they're sinful people. I'm talking about a very specific kind of rejection. I'm talking about a rejection that, that is, first of all, Jesus-centered. Right? You can throw that up on the screen, guys. Rejection that is Jesus-centered. In, in other words, it's people are rejecting you, people are turning away from you, people are, are pushing away from you and saying things about you and to you. They're rejecting you because you connect yourself to Jesus. Because you say, I follow him. Because you say, I believe this about Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Because you hold to the things that Jesus says is true and good and right. I'm talking about that kind of rejection that happens because you follow him. Secondly, I'm talking about a, a, a rejection that is Jesus-centered and that is undeserved. Peter, Peter kind of made that point, didn't he? That if you suffer and you were a jerk, even if you did it for the right reason, that something... I'm try, let me see if I... This is why I need you to pray for me so I can say it clearly. When you suffer for Jesus but you are a jerk you're still a jerk. Is that clear? Right, so when I say that, we're talking about, and so you, you kind of deserve, you ask for the rejection. If you, if you say something in an inflammatory, passive-aggressive, jerkish way, you deserve to be rejected. You ask for it, kind of. So I'm talking about a rejection that is Jesus-centered and that is undeserved, where, where as much as you can, you've spoken the truth in love, where as much as you can, you've confessed your faith in a clear, gentle, and humble way, where you simply presented the truth of God, and you were, you were less like a lion or a dog trying to fight yourself out of a corner and more like a lamb simply sharing what it is that you believe. And the Scripture says about this kind of, this kind of rejection that is Jesus-centered and undeserved, Jesus says that kind of rejection is actually a blessed thing. Jesus said that, didn't he? Blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me? Rejoice, he said, actually. Rejoice and be glad because great is the reward in heaven. See how Jesus says that about rejection. When people reject you because of him and they falsely, notice how he says it's not unjust, it's, just, it's undeserved. They falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's a blessed thing. And yet, that rejection, it still hurts. True? It's still painful. Even when you suffer for Jesus, for the, doing it in the right way, it's still a painful thing, and the question is why? Isn't it your tendency when you're, when you're presented with that kind of situation? There's, there's, two, there's two responses. The first one is, is, is reaching back into last week's text. It's, it's to be a little bit more like Peter than a little bit more and a little bit less like Jesus. When we're presented with, with testifying to the truth in a gentle, loving, humble way, the first response is to deny Jesus, to be silent, to say nothing when we should say something, to, be, to, to fail, to testify to what it is that's true. But that's painful on its own, isn't it? 
Because when we deny that we were connected to Jesus, when we're silent, when we should speak up about the truth of God's Word, when we avoid situations where we might have to, that's a painful thing all on its own because what's happening inside of us, we're denying part of what we believe. It's almost like we're denying, not only are we denying Jesus, but we're also denying ourselves because here on Sunday morning we say, I believe. And then by word and action we're saying, I don't. And there's an inner tension inside of us that's painful. Peter went out and wept bitterly because he knew, he knew what he believed, but he also knew what he said. And that's painful. There's another kind of pain that's associated with this, the, the, the kind of pain that comes because, because we take it, because we've spoken the truth, because we've confessed our faith in Christ, because we've said the hard thing, because we've done something as followers of Jesus that is good and right. But now there's something new, a different kind of pain, because now we've been rejected for doing the right thing. We've been rejected for standing up for the truth like Jesus did here in Luke chapter 22. But now what's the pain? We care a lot about those people. We care a lot about what those people who rejected us, we care a lot about what they think about us. Their opinions matter to us and that tears us up inside, does it not? Solomon was right. You guys, throw this verse on the screen. Solomon was right when he said that the fear of man will prove to be a snare. Now, fear, we, we always think like fear is a bad thing. And, and fear, when it's put in its right place, is actually a really good thing. Like, it's good for you to be afraid of a hot stove. That fear of a hot stove will keep you from putting your hand on the stove. But when that fear is too great, when that fear of the hot stove is too great, it'll keep you from cooking. Right? The right kind of fear will lead you to a place where you handle it properly. For another example, uh, fear of crossing the streets is a good thing. It will, keep, it will make sure you look both ways 17 times before you try to cross Hampton, and even then your, your head is on a swivel. It'll, it'll help keep you safe as you cross the street. But fear, too much fear of that, will keep you from living your life. Right? Fear of the right kind in, its right, in the right order, in the right place, it is a good thing. But fear when it's out of whack, it leads us into a dark place. And that's what Solomon's getting at. The fear of people will prove to be a snare. Let me offer a definition to that. Fear of people is this. It's to give too much weight to the opinions of people is to assign too much weight to the opinions of people. It's what Jesus was saying about some of the Pharisees who wanted to follow him. There were, there were some Pharisees who actually believed in Jesus, who confessed him, and, Je and yet they failed to say so publicly. They were silent when they should have spoke up. And Jesus said they loved praise of people more than they loved praise from God. It's the same kind of thing that Jesus said to his disciples when he said, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Don't be afraid of people. Rather be afraid of the one who can kill both the body and the soul in hell forever. In other words, right, don't assign too much weight to the opinions of people. And, and when, we're, <coughs> when we're faced with rejection or when we are rejected, is that not that the temptation? to care so much about what they think, whoever they are. To care so much about what they think that, that either two things happen. Either we give in to the pressure and we deny Jesus like Peter, or their rejection of us ruins us because they don't like us anymore because they've rejected us. It, our, our life, in, in, a, in a metaphorical sense, is, is over. You've been in that place before? Maybe in a dating kind of relationship, the, the relationship ends and like, oh, my life is over. That's, that's teen melodrama, but it's also like we, we care too much about what this person thinks of us. What I'm getting at is idolatry. We've 
we've assigned so much value to them and their opinion of us that we care less about the opinion of God. Jesus doesn't seem to care about the people. Now, let me clarify the word care. When, when, when I say that Jesus didn't care, it means that, doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have compassion for them, that he didn't love them. We, we know that Jesus did. We know that Jesus loved them. But, but here, their opinion of him, that was not the ruling factor in Jesus' life. The entire ministry of Jesus and even, and especially here in Luke 22, and we could expand this to, to the entire Passion account, right? Jesus lives his life ruled by the opinion of God. I mean, just walk through this mentally with me in Luke 22. Luke makes a shift. He's from Peter's denial. Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. And then he makes a shift from attention to Peter now to attention on Jesus. And Jesus, in the middle of the night, off in some side courtyard, the, the soldiers surround him like a pack of dogs, and they each take their turn, swinging at him, swearing at him, mocking him, ridiculing him, blaspheming him, spitting in his face. You, you can almost imagine fight club kind of thing where, where they're all around him, and this guy hits him, and this guy pushes him, and this guy slaps him, and this guy laughs at him, and this guy mocks him like a pack of dogs, each of them taking their pound of flesh. Keep in mind, this is before a trial, before the witnesses, before the questions, before the judge. And Jesus says nothing. If that's me, and the temple guard take me off to the side to rough me up a little bit, my first thought is, don't I get a phone call? Right? At least I'm going to say that. At least I'm going to plead my innocence. What are you guys doing here? But Jesus is silent. Why? Peter told us he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He didn't need to say anything. His God was his defender. His God was his vindicator. His God was his advocate. He didn't need to say anything to them because God was going to handle it. Jesus knew that. And then Jesus, they, they lead him to the judgment hall. Not before Pilate, that's next. But before the, the Sanhedrin, the, the religious rulers, the religious courtroom. And they, they, they ask him questions. Questioning, are you, are you who you say you are? Are you the Messiah? They, they, they turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, are you the Son of Man? It's a clear messianic title. Throughout the scriptures, Son of Man is a reference to the Messiah. And Jesus looks at him and says, you won't believe me if I tell you. But let me tell you this. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One in heaven. You will see, you, you may not bow to me now, you may mock me now, but one day you will see me where I rightly am, King at God's right hand. And they come to him again. You're saying then that you're the Son of God. Again, they're, they're, they're assigning a title to Jesus that's messianic all the way through. And Jesus, again, makes it clear, you are right in saying, I am. He claims for himself that title that God gave himself way back to Moses. When Moses asked him, who, when the people asked me who sent me, what should I tell them? God said to Moses, tell them I am sent you. You are right in saying, I am. See, Jesus' Jesus' entire testimony, his entire witness, his entire living like a lamb to be slaughtered before them was ruled by the opinion of God. See, this, Jesus was living not in fear of man, but in fear of God. And this is what fear of God is. The fear of the Lord, guys, throw this up. The, the fear of the Lord is to assign more weight to God's opinion. There's more to it than that, but that's a simple definition for today. It's to assign more weight to the opinion of God. And Jesus knew what that opinion was. Twice, God had said to him, from, from heaven, the, the clouds breaking open almost and the voice of God booming from above, what was it that his father said to him that Jesus heard so clearly? You are my son. 
God spoke to his son, not just about him, to his son. You are my son, whom I love. When God tells you he loves you, he means it. Whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So right there and then, Jesus had the approval and the opinion and the applause of God, his dear Father in heaven. And not just that, Jesus had the testimony of the scriptures at his back. Jesus knew what the scripture said about this entire thing. Jesus was not surprised by this mistreatment. He saw it coming. He told his disciples that this was coming. And so he walks into this and he's surrounded by them like a pack of dogs. That's Psalm 22, by the way. He's silent like a lamb. That's Isaiah 53, by the way. Jesus knew it. And he knew it was all about him. And so Jesus is there in the middle of this thing. All the scripture said this was going to happen. Not that he enjoyed it because it was fun, but because he knew who he was. God had spoken to him about who he was and what his purpose was, and so Jesus took it and entrusted his case and his cause and his life and his death to the Father who loved him. Luke wants you to know today who Jesus is. He wants you to know today that Jesus is who he says he is. The entire way that Luke writes this section, he's proving to you, and almost the implicit, uh, the implicit reading that he wants you to take from it is, Jesus is who he says he is. Remember, Luke is literature. He's writing historical account of the life, of, life and works of Jesus. And when he does so, I want you just to pay attention to your assumptions as you read it. Luke doesn't even have to say it. Go back through this text again one more time, real quick. Well, probably not real quick. I don't do anything quick. Sorry, not sorry. Luke starts by taking off to a side room where Jesus is beaten and ridiculed and mocked, where they spit on him. And your assumption is, if you're a reader, just reading this, you're like, that's wrong. That's unjust. They shouldn't be doing that. As you read Luke, that's, 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 Luke doesn't have to say it. He, you just know as the reader of this account, as the one hearing this account, that's what it is. He shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening to him. And then Luke puts the, these messianic titles five times in this text. Jesus is the great prophet. Prophesy to us, <laughs> great prophet from God. Then, then in the mouth of the, of, the, of the Sanhedrin, tell us if you're the son of man. Uh, well, yeah, you'll see me sitting at God's right hand. Well, are you the son of God then? You're right in saying I am. Again, what's Luke want us to read? What's Luke want us to assume? What does Luke want us to take away? Well, Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He's the anointed one. The, one, the Messiah, the anointed one of God sent for us. And, and the third thing is this whole suffering thing. Jesus endures suffering silently like a lamb. He goes to the slaughter. Jesus, Luke wants you to know, the Holy Spirit wants you to know that Jesus is the anointed one of God. Anointed for you for this. For abuse, for rejection, for suffering, for dying, for rises. God chose Jesus for this. And for you. Jesus is the anointed one, the one anointed by God to be rejected for your acceptance. See, Jesus, he is rejected not just by people, but in the end, as you keep reading this, he's rejected by God too. The, the God who said, this is my son whom I love, I am pleased with him. On the cross, God the Father turned his face from him, forsook him, why? Because when he looked at his son, he saw your sin. He saw your denial. He saw how you valued people's opinions more than you valued God's. He looked, when he looked at Jesus, he saw your sin. 
And so God rejected his, sin, his son and your sin on his son, and he rejected his son so that you might be accepted. That's the next fill-in. You were re- he was rejected for your acceptance. So that now the Father looks at you and says, you're mine. Right? You are loved by the Father. The, the ver- I know I say this a lot, but I've got to drill this into my own heart too. The Father says of you, you are my beloved, the one with whom I am pleased. Even in your sin, not with, he's not pleased with your sin, but for the sake of Jesus, he is yet pleased with you. He is the anointed one of God to be rejected for your acceptance. He is the anointed one of God to be your advocate before the Father, before God. That's the next villain. To, to be your advocate before God. See, now, now we, we go into the courtroom of God. Not the courtroom of human opinion, but in the, into, the, into the courtroom of God and his divine judgment. And you, and you stand there with your sin and your failure. You stand there with your idolatry and your sin. And it's, you have to say, it, I did it, because you did but then Jesus, your advocator, he comes in and he says, this is the, the image that the scriptures give us. That Jesus, your advocate, comes in and he says, Father, I died for them. More specifically, I died for her. I died for him. I died for that one. I, I already paid for that. He is your advocate before the Father as Tyshon, the, the atoning sacrifice for your sins, and not just for yours, for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. He's your advocate before the Father so that you, because of his advocacy, are acquitted, not guilty. The Bible word is justified, declared not guilty in God's courtroom because of the advocacy of your Savior Jesus. He was condemned by all these human courts, even in God's court, so that you might be acquitted. And finally, he is your defender before people. We, we don't often talk about this, but I, I want you to know this because it's so important. Because people will reject us, either, either just because they're sinful people or, 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 or because you follow Jesus. Both are true. He, but he's your defender. And, and I know that and you know that. And the best way for me to make this clear for you is, is to tell you the story briefly, I promise briefly, the story of David and how David dealt with rejection. Little boy David was a harp player for the king, anointed by God to be the next king. And when Saul got into his fits of rage, he threw spears at David, rejected him in the most severe murderous way. What did David do? He could have picked up the spear and thrown it back, but instead he dodged the spear and kept on playing. He entrusted his cause to the Lord. And though he, even though he could have taken the king's life and taken the kingship into his own hands, he said, the Lord will put me there when he wants me there. Maybe David even said, if he wants me there still. Later on in David's life, he was the king now, and his own son Absalom came to take the throne. And David's men around him said, David, it's, you're the king. We should stand up and fight. And what did David do? He dodged the spear and he kept on playing. No, this time he, he said, no, we're going to leave town. Even when Doeg is throwing rocks at me, we're going to leave town and entrust the cause to the Lord. If he said this, if the Lord wants me to still be king, I'll still be king. But if not, the Lord's will be done. In other words, he let Saul throw his spears. He let Absalom do, attempt his coup. And David simply entrusted his cause to the Lord. And this is what I'm trying to, trying to say, hard as it is. When you're rejected by people and people falsely say all kinds of evil about you because of Jesus, entrust your cause to the Lord. Our tendency is to want to fight, to pull spears out of the wall and throw them back. But if we can learn something from David, let the Lord fight. Entrust your cause to the Lord, even if it means you don't get your kingship back in David's case. 
Solomon said this. I'll finish the verse now. Fear of the Lord. Guys, throw this one up there for me. Fear of the Lord. This is the next slide. Fear of the Lord it proves to be a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is safe. Dear people of God, Jesus is the anointed one of God, anointed for you to be rejected so that you would be accepted, to first and most importantly be your advocate before God, to, but also to be your defender before people. The Lord is our helper, the psalmist says. I will not, we will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Amen? Amen. Now the God of peace grant you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen.